So um, let's get started. Uh, again, I'm Josh Corman. Uh, I, I like to say I'm Director of Security, but I'm Director of Security Intelligence. We already have a Chief Director of Security. Um, this is the DevOps Distilled panel, and you heard a lot of things about DevOps today. You heard a lot of things about Rugged, a lot of things about Rugged DevOps, even on the Comical Lunch panel. So I want to assume that everyone here saw the entire track. That would be a bad assumption. I also don't want to assume that none of you saw any of it. That would also be a bad assumption. So we were going to do some framing, but we're probably going to cut past that and see what kind of secondary questions you have. Um, let me introduce the other panelists. Gene's going to have to sit all by himself. Um, so again, if you want to live ridicule us on the Twitters, uh, you can do it at those uh, Twitter handles. Uh, this is Gene Kim, our keynote from this morning. Um, many things I could say about him, but one of them is the author, co-author of the DevOps Cookbook. Uh, James Wickett, um, who helped put together this fine show, made sure we had a DevOps track. It's his fault. And um, obviously launched Gauntlet today, which has a high affinity to this. He's been an early adopter of both Rugged and DevOps, and Rugged DevOps. And then, who, who just saw Nick's awesome talk? Okay, Nick Galbraith? He's still here, okay. Yeah. I guess I should probably characterize some of these guys. So, Gene's originally a security guy, who found DevOps to be transformational. Uh, James, you're basically a developer with a really high affinity for security, is that correct? Okay. Nick's really our true DevOps, true developer guy, not that no one else is. And then let me put on the Jumbotron, uh, David Morton, Mortman. We were gonna Skype him in, but apparently we don't have um, the technology. So this is him, we can now, easily assert that he has the biggest head on the panel. And I don't know how to characterize David, but uh, David's been a heavy personality in the security community and his, before DevOps was cool, I think he was really strong on automation and things like Chef and Puppet and in his day job. I guess I'll let you introduce yourself. Partly so we can test the audio. David? You're a developer guy, okay. Um, so each of these folks has been uh, attracted to and passionate about DevOps. Um, many of you, how many of you learned about DevOps for the first time today? Or at least you can actually define it after today? Okay, how many people don't think you can define it yet? Because we, we could do that, we don't want to skip that. All right, <laughs> the DevOps guy said, okay. Um, so let's just quickly, quickly, quickly do that framing. So Nick, could you please, with the mic, give us the best definition you can give of DevOps for people who didn't see your talk about the mic. That's good. Hey, uh, as, as kind of a good quiz, I'm just walking through everyone, like, what's your definition after today? You see all the Ooh. different diversity. So I could spoil it by giving my own, but. All right, I want to hear the first three volunteers will give us their best definition of DevOps, and we'll caveat it that you just learned about it today. No so, wrong answer. No judgment. Yes, you. I don't repeat that. Any way of the, breaking down the, the, the barrier, the wall between development and ops. Okay. Anyone else? Who's second? Come on. Come on. Yes, you. Getting the coders more involved in the release to production. All right. Coders more involved in the release to production. Anyone else? One more. What about Chris Ang back there? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You know what? As pedantic as this might be, I've heard each of you describe it differently, and I think they've all, they're all valuable. So each of you give me uh, your, your Cliff Notes definition. <laughs> um, basically, no division really between operations and development. It's really, they're both service organizations for the business, and so as such, they need to sort of work together. Yeah, I'd, I'd say. Uh, I like the, the way that Adam Jacobs said the Ops Code says he's like, it's a, a cultural revolution for professionals. And I think that's, that's fitting, uh, and you can, I think you should probably go a little bit further and say that, that we're in a new world and we have to operate in a new way. Um, yeah, I think it starts with two things, right? It's, uh, it starts with culture and values, but the goals really are fast flow to production, you know, as measured by high deploy rates, but uh, in my mind is also the simple, the reciprocal part, right? You know, by doing that, you can actually get stable, reliable, resilient, secure production environments of code and the environments. Um, and I think the way we get there is by 
as, as people were saying, you know, spanning boundaries that are right, right now silos. So that's individuals and people, individuals and organizations. You can hold on to that. What about you, David? And what about me? I, mean, I actually missed the question. Oh, you're not even paying attention. All right. So uh, DevOps, in a nutshell, how will you explain it to a layperson? It's about a partner. It's about making the the, the business uh, a partnership, a antagonistic relationship. All right, you're removing an antagonistic relationship. Okay, so we have we're having an IT fail again. The novel. Um, I mean, what what really attracted me to it is neither group needed new skills per se. We had all the skills necessary. It was a matter of alignment, right? And instead of sub optimizing for the way I usually say it is. Development is incented and bonus on making changes, and ops is incented and bonus on preventing changes to keep up time. So they're moral enemies, and when you focus on business value, really good things happen. So um, let's shift to why would a DevOps purist, it's going to be you, Nick, would even entertain tolerating the very toxic, negative, cynical crowd known as the security community. So what, what's the attraction to pull security into this? Uh, so why security, why DevOps, how this all happen? Sure. So it turns out, like, I don't know if you caught my talk earlier, but I've been doing this for a while, and certainly the first sort of job I was at was early. It was basically C and C++ servers. And it turns out stability, maintainability, and security are almost all identical at that stage because almost any stability bug you have is probably also a security bug. And, um, and what it really boils down to is good software practices. And that's what sort of, I like building things. And so security is just one of these things that you need to sort of like put in the development process. And that's how I got sort of sucked into all this. So I noticed you didn't say security sucks the will to live or gets in the way of business. It actually helped you do your job. Oh, security's, <coughs> security's good. I mean, it's fun. And like that, it's a good lever to sort of improve development processes. Um, a lot of developers like really respond to security stuff. They're frequently not empowered to do so, but security is a good way of luring people into all sorts of other engineering issues. So I think it's actually it's it's a good thing. Now, uh, David, if your audio doesn't break up, um, when we introduce DevOps to security people, they freak out. That level of change, that rate of change, you know, five deploys an hour, five deploys a a day even, is too much for us to handle. Uh, so. You, you actually like to counter some of those misconceptions. You think, so what, what do you tell a security person who thinks DevOps is insane and irresponsible and it's going to cripple and break all their security programs? Um, well, at first I point and laugh. Um, <laughs> it's broken our party. Um, and you know, you can save five deploys a day, try like five deploys a month and most security people had it, it seems. Um, I mean, the fact is that there's a lot of research going all the way back to like 1979 that shows that smaller changes are more effective, are easier to troubleshoot, and add less complexity. And you know, one of the you know, a premise uh, that a lot of security people talk about is that complexity is evil. And um, I'm a strong believer in that uh, less complex code is more secure. And so a lot of boxes is about making things less complicated. And so you should just you know accept that part and move on. Okay. Another one you brought up in the past is um, people freak out over the maybe some loss of separation and segregation of duty. Why is that not a problem? Uh, that, that's that's a great one. Uh, I think the, the thing to understand is you know what was what is the goal of separation of duties when it comes to uh, an information security context? And one of the one of the big goals there is to prevent people. Um, from making you know, unauthorized changes to systems, uh, especially ones you don't understand, the ones you can't detect well. I mean, one is when you're authorizing these you do things, so that's not a problem. The other thing is is that you're not really worried about, you don't have to, in a desktop environment, you don't necessarily or have developers logging into production servers playing code. This is all being done by automated systems where things are being tested and checked. Um, so if anything, it's going to be deployed more consistently and more effectively, more securely than it would be if a human, whether it's an ops person or a dev person, logging in and attempting to deploy this thing consistently the same way every place they go. Yeah, and there's, uh, I know one other thing we talked about in Brussels was 
if you look at most of the Verizon business data breach investigation report or the reports you get from Mandiant, most of these breaches are due to really basic lapses, default passwords, people basically creating to do the checklist manifesto stuff. So how do you see this as an opportunity there? Well, anytime you can get the human out of the equation and automate it, um, that's a good thing. I mean, the, the fact is, you know, computers are really good at doing the same thing over and over and over again, and people are really bad at that. So, uh, and one of the great things, you know, one of the premises, if you go back to like John Willis's, you know, uh, plans, cams, whatever you want to call it, um, acronym, one of the key ones there is automation, and any place you can re replace a human with a computer to do those repeated tasks, not only lowers the error rate, but it also frees up a person to do those harder tasks that computers aren't as good at. Yeah. I, I love this uh, quote. Um, when we go to sleep at night, machines laugh at us for humans doing things that machines should be doing, right? <laughs> <laughs> love that. Yeah. All right, so Dean, why don't you keep that mic? So uh, you're really the first security person I saw get incredibly excited over DevOps. So why do you see this as so transformational? Why has this caught your attention? Yeah, I was just talking about this with uh, John earlier, right? Um, so one of the things that if in my journey, I benchmarked uh, over 1,500 IT organizations really trying to link controls with performance. So we raised over a million dollars to do that. And one of, the, one of the goals was to see if we can actually create sort of the, the mandate, you know, to empower operations and security, you know, to, uh, you know, to do the right thing, right? To create a culture of controls. And, and that didn't happen. Right, despite the fact that we found that you know somewhere between a five to seven x difference between high performers and non-high performers, what we thought was good as a high performer, it was just like, you know, we thought it was an eight ounce cup. It turns out to be like an eighty-two ounce, you know, tumbler. Right, like you know, how good high performers are. Right, you know, we thought like a thousand changes a week was amazing. Right, Amazon does a thousand changes in a day, you know, in an hour. Right, and and so I, I think for me it just increases the business benefit of a culture of control. People on Facebook and Twitter they may say. You may hear them say, we don't like process. <laughs> my, my, my reaction almost universally is like, no way. You do a thousand production deployments a day, you actually have a process. Just because it doesn't look like a change management approval form doesn't mean you don't have a process, right? Uh, you know, they have, uh, Netflix has something called uh, this compliance monkey. If there's not an email address in the uh, service now form for a service, in other words, if there's not an account, uh, someone who owns a service, they kill the service, <laughs> right? Does that make sense? In other words, if you don't have an email um, owner in the free, all right, a developer in the, free, uh, in the field, they turn off the service. That's the culture of controls. That's rigor and discipline. So I'm excited because it, it shows the business value of controls, and it's bigger than just ops and security. It involves the entire tribe. You can do that. You have that? Okay. But, you know, let's, let's shift to the, the security role. Now, many of you heard about the legendary chaos monkey. Um, I want to talk about Chaos Monkey and Honey Badgers, et cetera, for two things. One is, probably start with attitude first. What struck me more than the functionality of Chaos Monkey it was the attitude and the willingness. So Chaos Monkey in a nutshell. Um, so Netflix wrote an entire Simian army, but their first and most uh, prominent and popular one is Chaos Monkey, which uh, in production is disabling and shutting off services. So what, oh great, we have another mic. We, we are fault tolerant. Okay. So um, their attitude and philosophy, which is kind of inspiring, is the only way to avoid failure is to fail all the time. And Gene told this story during his keynote this morning, but I was at the Source Boston Security Conference uh, two years ago in April, and there was a major Amazon outage, and every single person had to answer their pager or look at their email and leave the room, except for the Netflix guy. I'm like, what are you still doing here? He goes, oh, we're okay. We encountered this race condition you know, months ago. And it's not that you couldn't have a regional failover, it's that no one had done the work to handle everyone doing it at the same time. And it's just beautiful. They were ready because they tested rigorously continuously. And just to add uh, some color to the story, I learned this uh, earlier this year. Apparently, the Netflix guys didn't even declare a Sev1 incident until five hours in because they, their reaction was like, oh, Amazon will fix it. <laughs> five <laughs> yeah. hours in, they finally said, okay, maybe we should at least declare an incident. I thought that was amazing. Yeah. Now, I'm not the expert on the Simeon army, but they had such success with that monkey that they now have an entire Simeon army, including uh, the one you alluded to, which is compliance monkey, and that's really not industry compliance, but compliance with an internal policy. They have conformity monkey, uh, which makes sure that certain hardening guides uh, are in line for configuration. They have janitor monkey, uh, which uh, basically looks around for underutilized slices that cost a little extra money and aren't needed, so they shut them off. 
And they approached us and said, actually, we tried to insert ourselves as well. But some of us said, you know, we, really, we, we should really, after the Rogan Summit, when we worked for a week, we said we should make them an evil, demonic, demented security hacker monkey. Uh, it's, I don't even know if we have a monkey name for it yet, but then uh, Gauntlet, which we'll get to in a moment, was their willingness and desire to have us help them make some sort of security monkey or exploit monkey. Maybe it's blind SQL injection at all times in production. Maybe it's something a little, it's not gonna replace a more robust tool, but I love the attitude behind Chaos Monkey. Do you wanna add some color? You've been uh, yeah, closest uh, yeah. to that. Uh, yeah, the idea is you know, continually uh, you know, trying to, to take the security test. Yeah, you can't totally like, you know, have a pen tester. Like, it's, there's nothing you can do to replace a uh, human, you know, pen test an application. Um, but the idea is that at the end of that, when they're done done building, uh, or, you know, they have their exploits and they're able to, you know, show that you're vulnerable to a certain, uh, uh, you know, they're able to prove that. Instead of getting a PDF at the end of that, that big process, you know, 300 page document that the, the scanner dumped out and the, the guy kind of, you know, filtered, uh, now you could get some sort of automated uh, attack files that you can now put into your continuous integration uh, environment and things like that. So we're able to help look at like security regressions, and that's the kind of the direction that we want to go. Um, but yeah, Netflix is you know really looking at that and trying to make uh, more of that happen. I know Jason uh, Chan has a talk tomorrow on Netflix and the cloud. So. And I see Jeremiah Shirk, another uh, contributor in the audience, want to wave on the uh, Gauntlet project. Now, uh, we shouldn't equate Gauntlet with the security monkey for Netflix. Now, Netflix is in the process of open sourcing their semi army. Is that correct? And that's not done yet. Um, but one of our strategies, and this is maybe a bad strategy, but we said, look, a lot of these people who are trying to figure out should we copy DevOps, they're emulating Netflix. And we figured, if they're going to copy the DevOps, let's Trojan horse some security into that. Uh, so we're trying to influence an influencer before the, the cement is dry. And I think it's an interesting strategy. It's not really technical. Um, so if you're looking for levers, you know, if you can't get uh, a, a dev organization that you're working with now to uh, allow you to put, you know, chaos monkey in production, I mean, I, th I think the other kind of values that uh, it looks like that can get them there are, you know, find a person who, uh, you know, runs the builds, right? I mean, uh, yeah, at the very minimum, you need a culture where if someone breaks the build, right, then all work stops until, you know, the builds are running again. I was, uh, there was a software company I was familiar with where we had a broken build system for two years. Right? I mean, that's, that's you, know, um, you know, you can't get to 10 a day if you don't have, you know, uh, automated build systems, right? So once, once you, you know, have a build system where uh, if somebody breaks build, you swarm it until you fix it, now you can work on the next step, right? Integrating uh, automated testing, right? And once you're there, right, now we can talk about continuous deployment. Once you're there, you know, I think now you have an organization that's very receptive toward the chaos monkey-like, uh, you know, philosophy. Do you think the continuous deploy uh, or continuous build? Um, when you say that, like, do you think that comes before like a, like a configuration management thing, like Chef and Puppet, or is it just maybe kind of depends on your circumstance? But like, it, you know, for somebody that doesn't have any DevOps, like, you know, like, how would you start? You know, kind of going down that path. Gosh, you're such a smart guy, James. What would you, what do you? Think? Uh, I know. Uh, <laughs> You first. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think if uh, we're talking about sort of attacking the problem two ways, right? The dev to ops problem and the ops to dev uh, problem. I think from a, just a values and cultural perspective from dev, you know, you really do want to work towards continuous deployment. Um, yeah, John Allspot at Etsy uh, has corrected me numerous times. You don't have to be an agile shop to do 10 deploys a day, but you absolutely must have continuous deployment, right? That means that you're, uh, you're running tests all the time. You can deploy at any time at will. Um, and then, you know, I think once you have that, you know, the, the automated deployment, you know, you need to build all the environments at the same time. I think that's the fastest route to get there. The two things together, now you have to deploy today. So you mentioned the word leverage, and I wanted to bring this up. I wasn't able to bring this up during my talk, but how many people are actually in sort of like the development organization building product, or how many people are just purely in security? Purely security, yeah, like most people are. So let me tell you a little secret about developers. All good ones have secret side projects. <laughs> Every one of them. Oh yeah, you just called comments. And all the good developers I know have side projects. So Every one of them does. And You're not supposed to say that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You We're broke the code. We're talking about breaking <laughs> silos. So, so security people. You're Stop not the tape. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not like an expert programmer or whatever, that's OK. 
okay because there's a whole cognitive surplus waiting for you to leverage in the development organization. So really, I really recommend reaching out and like, hey, um, I'm having trouble like, you know, figuring out what's a good way to detect you know, SQL injection. It's like, oh, what's all that? Next thing you know, they're building stuff for you. Sound familiar to saying? Uh, yeah. <laughs> So it's like there's so much development interest actually in it, but their jobs or the political culture of your organization might not allow it. So just reach around it. Oh, oh wow. Wow. Man, <laughs> I just <didn't> say that. <laughs> I can hear the tweets exploding yeah. now, right? Yeah. <laughs> that almost sounded planned. Almost sounded right. planned. No, that's just my retardation in action. Yeah. Um, seriously, like talk to developers. Whatever problem you're having, tell them and get them to do it for you. And next thing you know, you're going to build an organization around it. Uh, Nick, I'm looking at Twitter. Apparently, you have to be funnier than that to uh, be tweeted. <laughs> oh. You know, when, uh, <laughs> I, I've been uh, working on DevOps for several years now. I don't know when we, was that 2010 or maybe a little earlier? But uh, we, were, we were working at uh, National Instruments, and we were working on some cloud products. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot like that. You know, we had dev operations kind of sitting together, and we'd have discussions, and then not only do they have the good developers have side projects, they have like good side projects inside your organization, you know, solving problems. And like, I see Karthik back there, but he had like random code running on his, uh, under a box underneath his desk that uh, over time everybody's like, yeah, that's really cool. We, we really need that. And we start like, you know, sharing that out to everybody and they had like, you know, cool dashboards and, and, uh, and views and things like that. But, you know, they weren't um, stuff that were like, you know, top down, it was just stuff that we started building from the ground up, so. You know, I want to pivot a little bit because I'm seeing some of the same faces I saw in the hallway this morning. Uh, a lot of that question, if you're at the lunch uh, speed debates of, isn't DevOps too expensive? Or, you know, we're a waterfall shop or we're pseudo agile, so we can't do this. Um, you know, perhaps that's our fault for the way we talk about it, but I don't think you need to be a DevOps shop with a DevOps flag to start donning the spirit and attitude of a chaos monkey or starting linking incentives and cross pollinating. So, what do you think, uh, how do we break down that barrier that you don't have to actually have a lot of money? In fact, I think it, the question was kind of ludicrous. I, no, I think that it's more, it's more of an instance where usually the big companies are the ones that I would say would have a hard, time, have a yeah. time, have a hard time doing DevOps. Um, and usually uh, DevOps in the enterprise uh, usually means you take a, you know, a Greenfield team and throw them off to the side and say, hey everybody, you know, we're, gonna, we're gonna do something cool over here. Um, seems like DevOps works really, really great in a small organization. So back to the attitude thing. Um, Actually, go ahead. so I thought so too. In fact, um, uh, I, I've been trying to figure out, you know, what is the, uh, how do you objection handle? You can't do DevOps in an enterprise. And I went to, uh, it was the HP uh, Discover Conference, and there were like seven talks from like uh, organizations like Unum, World Bank. Um, uh, in fact, if you email me, I'll, I'll email you all my notes from those sessions. But, you know, I asked them, why would organizations, you know, object to doing DevOps? And they looked like, they looked at me like I was an idiot. They're like, why enterprises want to do DevOps too, right? And, but it may come from different, uh, the champion might be different than, well, certainly it was different than what I thought. It comes from uh, the QA group, right? It comes from uh, the project management group. In one case, it was like the service-oriented uh, architecture group. Uh, so, you know, they, they're driving these type of projects, even in the largest enterprises. Um, and that's an open offer. I, I can send notes uh, of all the tweets I made uh, you know, at that conference as well as this conference as well. Yeah, I, I really don't think you have to have a major top-down approval to do this. I think what happened with a lot of these guys is it happened organically and naturally. And when you started actually showing business value, you were doing more with less. You were uh, more competitive than your competitors. I mean, those things tend to get a snowball effect and they're positive. Now, um, the other thing to remember is that DevOps is so much more than continuous deployment and configuration management. Say more. Amen. I mean, the thing is that you know, it's you go, it goes back to John Willis's stuff. It's culture, automation, measurement, and sharing. The automation is, in, you know, from a technology perspective, is really cool. It's awesome, and it's really easy to talk about. But it tends to, I think, over uh, overarch uh, in a bad way the fact that this is really about having a it, remember DevOps is a philosophy. It's not a framework. It's a way of doing. It's a way of approaching the problem, which is solve the problem first. Automation is useful is a useful way of doing it, but you have to measure. You have to understand what's going on. Because if you don't know, what's, if not measuring, then how do you know what to fix? And it's about sharing information back and forth to get things done. 
It's really the four hour work week of you know, the software world. So I'm gonna stay with you for a second because um, a lot of people think a major DevOps transformation would be very hard. I think you've been doing DevOps before you called it DevOps. You tend to be a big fan of automating security stuff. So what's a really tangible first product that you did to prove the value? Did you just, or are you just a tyrant and did what you wanted to do? Well, I mean, the thing is, I mean, whatever you call it, I mean, long before, you know, I mean, the idea of having development operations work together is obviously not new to DevOps. But, you know, even as something as basic as if you're managing an in-house product, you know, product you're developing in-house, get development as third-tier support. You know, have the, so they understand, you know, they feel the pain when something's broken, or, you know, when something's broken, you're not sitting there spending hours trying to solve it, but when you know who wrote the code, and then they can tell you in five minutes where the, you know, where the issue is. They can do the troubleshooting. It's about working together and, you know, breaking down the fences of those walls between the organizations to get shit done. Oh, I have to bleep you. Um, so, you can bleep me as much as you want, but I mean, the fact is, the DevOps is about getting shit done. All right. So Wicket, you also made no excuses, you made progress. I had a slide in my talk earlier about you can make excuses or you make progress. You just seem to confidently act in that direction. So for people who missed your, your Gauntlet talk, I mean, Gauntlet was an idea, now it's a deployed tool. You know, how can these people find it and use it? And you know, I'm not giving you a sales pitch opportunity here, but. Well, I'm glad you asked, because uh, it's really easy. You know, uh, uh, we're, we're actually doing some office hours tonight at uh, 10 o'clock at the bar. Uh, if you want to come talk Gauntlet, uh, Jeremiah's buying everybody drinks. <laughs> I don't think that's the case, but um, but we'd be happy to talk to you about how to get that implemented. Um, uh, the question is, but the question is more like, how do you start um, from nothing and then start trying to implement stuff and trying to put things? Because, and I think Gene, you had a talk where you were talking about like no more platitudes and like you know we we often like have all these like grand schemes and philosophies that we talk about and then it's like but. No, show me the code. Like, you know, I was like, how do we, how do we like fix this thing that's that's in a meaningful way, or how do we start making uh, movement in the right direction? And I think that uh, that, that kind of changes it. And when you have your dev and your ops team all collaborating together, you know, in the same source control and like working together to push things uh, out, that actually makes a difference um, because we we can blame the developers a lot, but I mean, operations people are just as much to blame because they they've fallen far away from the. Um, um, you know, from the, the cycle and they're like, I don't even know how to get into, you know, SVN or, or GitHub or whatever. Um, and, and they just, they're, they're, they're so, there's such a departure from um, the code because they're so worried about putting out all the fires. And, and I think we've talked about it and there's been those uh, things earlier talking about the walls of confusion, but it's actually really natural because you have 100 or 200 developers to, you know, five to 10 operations to like one security or half the security or that, you know, a security intern or something. And um, and you're gonna have like, it's just gonna get worse and worse as you go and there's gonna be, uh, they're, they're not gonna be operating at the right levels. What's the right ratio? Maybe devs two to one ops or three to one ops, but it depends on what you're doing. Um, but a, a sane work ratio is like, is the first start I think for a good DevOps program. Now, uh, I'm probably gonna wrap this up so we can take your questions. Um, we have a, almost, a little over 15 minutes, probably 15 minutes left for a lot of time. Um, so please think of your questions right now. But one of the things Gene Kim and I did at the Rugged Summit was we argued and we didn't win the argument, but we tried to say let's spend the entire week exclusively looking how to, to take advantage of this window of opportunity with DevOps. So let's not try to solve for legacy apps and previously deployed apps and existing entrenched products. And, and rational people can debate if that's the right approach or not. We're not saying give up, but we felt perhaps there was a better asymmetric yield if we doubled down on this. And uh, so I want to ask each of you, what's the best potential way to capitalize on the existing body of work with OWASP, BSIM, OSAM, Rugged? How, what's the best way? Is it for us to introduce DevOps to our peers so we can be the one who brought it to the business? What are your thoughts? I'll go uh, with you first, David, I guess, since you're on the Skype. What's the Just hook, the it, best dude. hook for security, I guess? Just do it. I mean, <laughs> like, don't talk about it, but do it. Just do it. Just do it. Very profound. Maybe some more specific examples is, so let's just say you're a damaged organization. You know, dev and ops not working together, you're the security guy, what can you start doing? I don't know, is there a WordPress on your site? Sure it is. Okay, start automating all the tests you would do. You know, 
Gauntlet's actually really good because it sort of gives you DevOps, but not necessarily needing buy-in with all the different organizations. You can just start launching it and automating poking holes, you know, at your infrastructure. So again, it's just sort of like just getting it going is really the first thing. You be careful because it goes off really well. You might be managing the ops group, so that's a whole different problem. But that's a good one to have. Okay. Yeah. You know. Uh, uh, I had, the, you know, the ratios I was just giving there earlier, those aren't like just numbers that I, those are numbers that have, of a previous employer and, uh, and you know, what we did is we took, uh, you know, a subset of the crew and said, all right, you're going over here to create products in the engineering group and, uh, you know, it's going to be better, you know, and it was. And so um, maybe, you know, maybe that's, that's part of it, so. Gene? Yeah, I don't know what comes in the middle, right? But I mean, I, th I think it begins by, you know, well, I totally agree with Nick when he said information security practitioners are in a unique position, right? Because we see the end flow. We see all the, the harebrained sort of decisions that lead to bad outcomes. So I mean, I think the first thing is, you know, to be able to say to other people in the organization, I, I totally see what's happening, right? And be able to predict the future, right? If we keep doing this, we have more and more technical debt, we think they're gonna slow down. <laughs> and now we're arguing about what features can go in into the product five years from now, right? And that makes no one happy, right? And I think, you know, uh, whatever, however we attack it, right? And I think kind of some of the patterns that we're still for the book, right, are, you know, the various ways that you can actually, you know, iteratively implement DevOps type uh, patterns. But I mean, in the end, right, the reaction should be, oh, thank you. Thank you so much for pointing this out. Thank you so much for helping me see something that I didn't see before. Ah, oh, thank you so much for getting these people to work together, you know, in a way that they never did before. I mean, so, you know, I think it will be different for everyone, but I mean, you know, uh, Nick, you know, uh, reminded me again, so the problems that he's dealing with in his new company was like Etsy a couple years ago. And, you know, uh, they look like deployment failures, they look like operation problems, but they're DevOps style problems, right? Um, by the way, one of the best uh, videos I've seen on this was uh, given by a gentleman named Michael Rembetsi on, uh, he called it Continuous Delivery of Culture. It was just basically the entire story, like from uh, 2007 to 2012, on their journey. And it was literally one of the top five presentations I've seen in terms of, uh, you know, here's our problems, here's what we did about it, here's what worked, here's what didn't work, repeat five times. I mean, I thought it was just fantastic. And uh, I'll find that link and I'll tweet it out uh, later today. But I mean, I think that will resonate with an ops person, a security person, and a dev person. And, uh, you know, to first, um, to solve any big complex problem, the first thing we need is empathy, right? In the sense that we genuinely understand this problem. And I think this video could actually help in that. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't really explain the honey badger, but I, I think upon reflection, at the time I didn't think it was that big a deal, but upon reflection, um, one of my favorite parts of the rugged handbook and implementation guide, and they're, they're incomplete, but it was that notion of a story. So whether you have a DevOps established yet or not, creating your security story touches the CIO, the architect, the developer, the QA, security, that might be a chance for one of you to take a leadership slot and say, for this particular use case or for this particular new project, let's gather that story of what would actually drive business value. So it may be a poor man's version of having your first DevOps-like conversation. Uh, I'm going to open the floor. In, in yeah, a that, second. I, I wanna, well, I want to follow up with, with both Gene and Josh here. Um, but do you think InfoSec can really be the bringer of DevOps to the organization? Because haven't they already just been kind of irrelevant? Right Are you trying to call the bait? I'm just asking because I mean I, it's fair. I I think that I just don't think that that's like uh, I don't know I don't think that's the angle that, that no. where it can be injected um, because the ratios have been skewed the infosec people are just like you know <laughs> auditors that come around once a year I, I don't know I mean it depends on the organization but I just don't know if they have the the street cred inside the organization to pull off something like this and so um, you know what do you do in that kind of situation? What are you afraid? <laughs> <laughs> just just. Call it like it is, maybe. Um, my, my quick answer is it's, it's, great, it's a great question. And I'm not saying this is the path forward, but I don't want to, what I often see with security people is we wait for some, the business to do something first. And there was a, as a sl tiny aside, Harvard Business School had a blog on the, the next gen CIO, not a CISO, CIO. And there were four hats a CIO was going to have to wear. And most CIOs were good at one of those four hats. So everyone was saying, oh great, this is gonna further make, make us marginalized. And they were all belly aching on Twitter. So I said, here's what you're all gonna do. You're gonna take your CIO to lunch, if you're a CISO, and you're gonna print this thing out and you say, hey, I read this great article and I noticed we butt heads on a lot of projects, but if you look at these different roles, you know, we might actually be natural allies on these two. Maybe your business intelligence project to do data classification can help my data security project. 
And a couple people took me up on it. It was the best meeting they had with their, their business leader. So, you know, I'm not eternal optimist. I'm not saying that, you that should is, do that. That is breaking down the walls. So it is good. a boundary yeah. spanning device. So yeah. I'm not saying it's the best path, but I think if you want to be passive and wait, you can be prepared for DevOps. If you want to try something, experiment, try that security story that we all want. Yeah, oh, I guess we'll go down here. But uh, yeah, you know, I mean, to your, to your point, I would also say like, um, you know, being able to have testing, you know, you, we may not have the data on that, that particular piece, but if we had, if we could say like automated testing, is it better or worse? I mean, just anecdotally, you'd be able to say, you know, yes, that would be good. Or, or with the, you know, we don't want to just, it's bad to kind of shoehorn uh, DevOps into uh, continuous deploy. And, and when you go to the DevOps conferences or stuff like that, everybody there is like config management, you know, and everybody's like chef and puppet, you know, and, and so it's funny, like, you know, everybody, you know, kind of internalizes DevOps a little bit differently, and, and that, that's okay. Um, but you want to be thinking about how you can, um, you know, work on some security testing that's able to, like, you know, cross the cross those, those gaps and those chasms with the other people in the organization. And uh, I think that's that's useful, um, and I think that'll definitely help something. Yeah, just to resonate with uh, uh, Nick and uh, James. I mean, again, the, re the re ideal response is, you know, you want to do something with development, and the ideal response is, thank you. <laughs> that was really great, right? Because, you know, uh, what you really want is shared goals, right? And, you know, be able to bring capabilities and expertise to bear, right, in a way that doesn't result in, like, oh, go pound sand, right? It's like, oh, man, that was really awesome. Let's, what else can we do together, right? And I think that's what really creates that, the notion of a, a tribe larger than just InfoSec and Dev, right, or InfoSec Dev and Ops. You know, that's really a team that's trying to you know, solve the greater goals. And I think uh, you know, that's an incredible journey. So Mortman, unless you're muted, do you have any departing guidance? Uh, don't, uh, don't get caught up in automation and don't forget the reach around. Oh. <laughs> All right. I, mean, that, no, I just want to say, it's amazing how many new followers I've picked up in the last 30 minutes. <laughs> I mean, my attitude on this is uh, I think DevOps is going to be picked up by more people, or at least the tenants. So security people have a choice. They can fear it or they can embrace it. And uh, hugs are better than fear. So um, yeah, reach around and whatnot. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I think this is an opportunity we've been looking for for years, right? If, if we've been doing the same technical approach, if you came to my talk, we've been doing the same technical approach, we're not getting much many different results. We're not going to get many at-bats like this, so run at this, dive in, learn it, love it, and figure out how to conform our trade craft and our art to actually drive the business value we've been wanting to. So with that, I will thank you for your time, and uh, that's it. All right.